Well, welcome to Radius Church Online. We are so glad that you have joined us again. And once again, I have a handful of people that have made the journey out here, and uh, they're glad you're watching also. And uh, there they are. So please do this. If you're watching online, I've noticed in the last three to four weeks, uh, the, the comment section has kind of died off. And so the, the amount of people watching is still about the same, but the percentage of people commenting is not as much. So I don't know if that means my messages are getting worse or if you're out on the boat while you're watching the message and you just don't have time to reach over there and say amen. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm going to go with out on the boat, all right? And, uh, but just let me know you're there. Give me a thumbs up. Say hi. Uh, just let me hear from you a little bit. It's kind of my way of having a virtual foyer, if you would. I miss so much gathering together, as you do. But what I really miss is the high fives out in the foyer in between all the services and the energy. So uh, kind of say hi. If you like the point, you know, it's an inside joke around here. Give me a little salsa dancer or something like that, all right? And that would be great. Um, I am glad you are here. How many have ever, I'll take a poll here and online. You can raise your hand or you can just type in me. How many of you have ever been stuck somewhere you wished that you weren't? Everybody, it's 100%. Uh, I just, you're stuck somewhere that you just wished, if I could just click my heels together and be back home, right? Uh, I had that happen about this time last year. Uh, I was speaking at a men's conference in Memphis, and uh, I was uh, going to catch a flight when I got done speaking to get back home for our services here. And so I got to the Memphis airport. Now, if you've ever been to the Memphis airport, I apologize, my Memphis friends. It's nothing to brag about, all right? And, and it's like the last airport in the world, please forgive me, that you would ever want to be stuck in. I used to work there when I was 18 years old, and so I didn't want to be stuck there. So I got to the airport and was checking my bag and looked and said, and, or I didn't look and see, the, the ticket agent said, your flight has been canceled. I was like, oh, no. And my buddy had already dropped me. I was on my own. And, um, and so I said, well, do I have any other options? They said, well, there's a, my connection was in Atlanta to come to Seattle. I know. That's just the way it works. And, and I said, man, is there anything else I can do? Is there any flights anywhere? They said, there's a flight on this plane. It's the last one going out because there's tornadoes coming in. And I said, is there a seat on this flight? I mean, it was like boarding at the moment. And they said, there's one seat, it's in the middle, and it's in the back row. How many know you got to really want to go home to take that seat? You know what I'm saying? And so I booked down there, I jumped on the airplane, the plane took off, and we got to the Atlanta area, and, but we started circling and circling and circling. I've never circled this long. We circled the Atlanta airport for about an hour because there were storms beneath us. And uh, finally, the, the pilot got on and said, okay, we're going to have to divert you to Nashville. And so we're on our way to Nashville. We get to Nashville. We are on the descend. I mean, you can see the runway. There it is. And then all of a sudden, he pulls up and takes back off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess you recognize we're back ascending, and they have cleared us for landing in Atlanta. So now we're going back to Atlanta because the storms have blown through. But if you know anything about travel, if Chicago Airport or Atlanta Airport messes up, everything's messed up, right? And so we landed in Atlanta. All the flights were jacked up. And so they asked me to wait in a line, which I'm really good at waiting in lines because patience is one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> you know, it really hurts me when you laugh at me like that. And, and so I waited in this line, and I'm by myself. Who am I going to complain to anyway, right? And so I waited in this line literally for about two hours, and by then it was somewhere around midnight, and... Uh, and they sent me to a, and well, first of all, I said, well, man, I need to get back to Seattle. When can I get a flight? I'm expecting them to say tomorrow morning. They said our earliest flight that's not full going back to Seattle is like on Tuesday. And this was like Friday. And, and I'm like, well, that, <laughs> that just ain't going to work. Jake, you're preaching. You know, I mean, that's just not going to work. And they said the best you could do is be here at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's already midnight, right? And so I went to my hotel, slept, 
got back, got on a standby, got back anyway. But through all of that, you know, there were times I just wish, I just don't want to be here. I'm sure you can relate to that. I, and nothing against Atlanta, but I didn't want to be in Atlanta. I wanted to be in Washington with my peeps. And, uh, and I, I tell you that story because in our series, I start thinking about these dead bones. Those soldiers that died there, that's not where they wanted their life to end. If they had a voice, they would say, this is not... This, this, this is not how I envisioned my end. This is not where I want to be stuck. Uh, the, the dead bones, they're stuck. They're stuck in a valley. They're, they're not at home. They're not in the comfort of home. They're not even on a mountaintop. They're not even in a good church service. Come on. They are stuck in the ravages of war in a valley where they have evidently lost a battle. Dead, dry, defeated. That's their stopping place. That's where they will forever be stopped in a dead, dry, defeated place. And I want you to know that right now, maybe especially in this time, but maybe it's been a struggle throughout your lifetime, that the devil also wants you to think that failure is your home. Where you messed up. Some of you where you failed. Some of you where you got abused. Some of you where you got hurt. That's been where you have been for month after month, even year after year. I know people that have gone through tragedies in life and they have not moved forward from that thing. And the enemy wants to convince you that where you're at is where you have to stay. But I'm here to declare to you one more time, come on, that where you're at is not where you have to stay, everybody. Our hurt, our defeat, our discouragement is not our permanent place. It doesn't have to be our permanent place. This story, if anything, it reminds me. Uh, this story reminds me of that. Again, the story to me epitomizes what we see around here all the time. Where we're at is, is not... Let me say it another way. Where we're at is not where we have to stay. P.S. No matter how dead it looks. No matter how dysfunctional it looks. No matter how hopeless it looks. No matter how long it goes. Come on, is anybody hearing what I'm saying, right? Uh, what looks like it in... And, and maybe that's why we have Ezekiel 37. Because it's not just a soldier that's dead. It's a soldier that has been dead a long time and dried up. It looks like an impossible situation. The bones aren't just decayed. They're scattered all over the valley floor. Uh, and it looks... What looks like an end was really just the beginning. During this season that we're all in, there's been some endings for some people. There, there, there's been some ending to normalcy. How many know exactly what I'm saying? There's been some ending to church like we know it. There's been ending to school like we know it, to work like we know it. People are trying to navigate, how do I work at home and have daycare in my home all at the same time so there's been some ends but the fact of the matter is that with God there's never an end without a new beginning you can't turn the page to close one chapter come on without opening the page to a new chapter and maybe that's what God has going on see this valley reminds us that even though it is dead even though the situation is dead, even though it looks dry, even though it feels disconnected, this story reminds me, as hopeless as you can get, there's still a bone collector. And there's a bone collector, and he specializes, I, I just hope you get this point, the bone collector specializes on gathering dead things, hopeless things. Things scattered out on the valley floor. Right, everyone? It would appear that this valley are the once vital strong army's final resting place, but the valley wasn't their home. Come on. That, the valley is not our home, everybody. You might be going through a tough time. This COVID has hit people in all kind of different ways, but I'm telling you, it's not our home. It's not our final destination. Come on. And play it out. Keep playing it out. And keep, if you want to, keep, uh, keep imagining the worst case scenario. Well, eventually the worst case scenario gets you to death. But death is still not your home. Can I get an amen on that one, everybody? In fact, if you're in the room, say it with me. If you're watching, 
Come on, either say it or type it out. The valley is not my home. I want you to remember that. Come on, say it together. The valley is not my home. Now, I was reading this text, and I was so excited to get down there to the bones rattling and, you know, all that fun, exciting things. You know, when I read it, I imagine all that stuff happening. And, and often we, we come across, at least I do, an opening verse, uh, and I view the opening verse as, you know, I kind of skim through till I get to the, fun, the, the things I like. Have you ever done that? You, you, you know, I don't want to read Leviticus. I want to get to the Red Sea and the, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, and so I kind of made the mistake when I was reading Ezekiel 37, getting down there, prophesied to these bones and can the bones live. And, and I just was kind of reading through verses number one and two, just kind of getting through there, kind of like an introductory, um, um, and, and maybe not paying, paying attention, but maybe not quite as much attention. I, Maybe if your tendency is like mine, my tendency when I pick up a book, I kind of skim through the forward. When I watch a movie, I kind of, you know, the first few seconds, I just, every once in a while somebody will say, now, when you watch this movie, the first minute is very important because they know my tendency. You know, it's like, when, when, the, when things start exploding, then I'll pay attention. I mean, there's nothing I can think of exploding in Bible stories. But anyway, all right. And, and so uh, I, I made this critical mistake of overlooking verse number one as just setting of the scene. But there's so much more to it. And it's really where I want us to dive. And you're going to have to kind of concentrate on this one a little bit. This message is one that, that you, you might want to finish breakfast. Put me on pause. Finish breakfast. Because you're going to have to think on this one just a little bit. Because this opening verse has so much to say to us that if you grew up in church and you read about the bones coming together, you might have missed it. Or maybe you're way ahead of me and you've been thinking about it a long time. But we're going to look at it together. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 1. Let's check it out. I told you I'd come back to it. It says, The hand of the Lord was on me. Now, if you're new to watching our messages, when we highlight the words, that means we're going to come back to those words. And whenever you see the hand of the Lord in Scripture, it's representative of divine power. Or, let me say it one other way, supernatural power. Now, don't get weirded out by the word supernatural. All the word super means is superior, so superior to natural. In other words, I don't need somebody's hand, I need supernatural divine power right everybody and so I want you to see this because um, the hand of the Lord was upon me Ezekiel was saying he says man I, I, I have divine power of God I have supernatural touch from God one translation says that the power of, or his hand was upon me and lifted me up and, and, and the hand of the Lord was upon me and many of us get fired up about wanting God's hand upon us. We want God's blessing. We want God's favor. All of us do. We want God's blessing. We want God's favor. But watch what happened when Ezekiel got the blessing and got the favor and got the anointing and God's hand on him. He didn't just lift him up just to lift him up. He lifted him up to take him low. I know, right now you're wanting to turn this message off because you're not liking the direction it's going. But hang with me for a minute. And He brought me out by the Spirit. Some translations say He brought me low by the Spirit. In other words, I want you to see the contrast. He, he brought me up and He brought me low. He brought me up so He could bring me low. Follow me, everybody. By the Spirit of the Lord. And He set me... In, and he set me in the middle of a valley. I, I don't know about you, but I get word plays going on, and it, it's it, it's one thing. How many know when you first start into a problem, you got a little bit of energy? How many know what I'm saying, right? I mean, it, it's like, okay, bring it on. I remember when the governor came on and said we're going to close down for two weeks. I'm like, Yahoo! I can handle a two week break. Bring it on. But now somewhere in the middle of the valley, hello, it's not quite as fun anymore. Netflix has driven me crazy. I've watched it all. It's not quite the vacation. It's not the beginning of the valley. And, and we might not be far enough along to see the light at the end of the tunnel that we're almost done with the valley. 
It seems like every time I think I'm almost out, I get a new report. So he brought me up. His divine hand was upon me so that he could set me down in the middle of a situation. Have you ever had a situation? <laughs> Shazam, Gomer Pyle, we're in a situation right now. And I'm not going to try to say whether we're in the beginning or the end, but I feel like most days I'm still right in the middle of it. Can I get an amen on that? And, and, and so He builds me up by His divine power and, and He takes me low. Wow, that's what hit me. In other words, Ezekiel, watch this, let me paraphrase it, Ezekiel was blessed to be a blessing. And it's hard to be a blessing unless you go to where there's a blessing that is needed. You don't need to go to the soldiers that are alive and well. No, no, you've been blessed so you could go to the dead, defeated, discouraged, disconnect. Oh, man, come on, somebody. Are you hearing that? And so maybe God doesn't just bless us to bring us high, just to bring us high, you know, so we can have those spiritual goosebumps. Maybe He blesses us and rescues us and redeems us and restores us so that He can... Maybe He brings us really high so that He can trust to bring us really low because there's still some dead things back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if not those that have been built up, then who? Dead soldiers don't prophesy to dead soldiers. <laughs> Woo! Dead soldiers prophesied to Facebook. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just can't help it, guys. I just can't help it. You can edit it if you want to. Or you can send me a nasty email to markevans at gmail. <laughs> what if everyone... Okay, I'm going to go here for just a minute, all right? But just think about this for a minute. What if everybody right now in the church world let me just talk to our church. What if everybody in the radius church world that has an income, that has a job, recognize that you're blessed in a time where a lot aren't? Not just to be blessed, not just to buy another can of beanie weenies, but so that you can give back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, to be a blessing. What if you put meat in the storehouse so that when single mamas come that have lost their jobs and their kids are at home, they call the church and the church can be there always ready to help and never turn anybody away. Can I get an amen on that? What if you're blessed to be a blessing? Come on, somebody. In fact, it reminds me, uh, if I can remember it right off, uh, Jesus, when He showed up, Luke chapter number 4, He said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to set the captives free, to open the blinded eyes. In other words, God's divine power is on my life, not just to roll in it, but to go to those that are in captivity, those that are hurting. In other words, God's anointing is on our life to deal with problems, everybody. Maybe God allowed us to be born and live during this season, and before we got to this season, He built you way up so you could handle going way down. Mm -hmm. Woo, I like that. Have you, have you, let me ask this question. Have you ever come to church and just have the perfect service? You know, they did all your favorite songs and the pastor didn't preach too long. He didn't preach too loud. He, he, you know, he, he was just funny enough and just spiritual enough and just prayed just right and, and stood there with the right posture and used just the, and you got all fired up. Have you ever had one of them services like, wow, that was electric. And, and God has blessed you, but before you get home, somewhere the devil hitchhiked into your car? Has anybody ever had that happen? It's like you're fighting before you even... Man, wasn't that good? Oh, God is good. What'd you say to me? And then it, sit down back to you. And it's like, it's over. It's on. I got a bunch of people in the crowd right now. They've been through it. Huh? And... and and, and, and there's an issue that wants to take you down. And what we usually do is blame it on the devil. 
Oh, yeah. I think the devil, you, you know, the devil's behind a lot. But, you know, the devil gets blamed for a lot of things that ain't the devil. It's you. Right? But what if God has blessed you? He has healed you. He has restored you so that He can allow you to deal with the edges that you're fighting about. Mm. What if you were, what if you are to be the life giving voice to a whole family that doesn't know Christ? What if you're to be the life giving voice? What if God has rescued you out of your family so that you can be the life giving voice in your family? What if God has brought you real high and put you in that job so that you would be the light? What if God has brought you real high so that you could be the voice of encouragement in a time that is filled with discouragement? What if God has blessed you that way? Um, see, we all have skeletons in the closet. And what if, what if you're that voice to the things that lie dead in the valley of your soul? valley of dry bones I don't know that I need to be transported to a valley of dry bones we might have some dry bones right here you ever heard skeletons in the closet don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about because you got them we all got skeletons in the closet skeletons in the closet past mistakes past hurts feelings failures all of those things. But maybe God's hand has been upon you so that He doesn't just secure your future, but allows you to go back and redeem your past. Come on now, are you hearing that tonight? We, we all have skeletons. We all, all of our lives are filled with secrets and hurts and failures and death. But maybe God is showing you that what died in one stage of your life can now be resurrected in another stage because He has carefully taken the time to take you high so that you can go back low. Otherwise, all you do is get saved and wait on the bus to take you to heaven. But what if He's in the process of redeeming you? So He brought you really high so that He can go back and heal that hurt and heal that abuse and heal that abandonment and heal those things that you're still silent about. What if He's opening the closet where all the skeletons reside because these bones can live again. These hopes can live again. These dreams, come on, can live again. And you'd have the courage to stand up and go at it again. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Woo! You are now strengthened and you're healed at this stage of your life and that He has the ability to secure your future and heal. These bones can live again. Some of us have those dead, defeated skeletons in the closet. Something that died. What has died in you? What have you just tried to forget about? What have you tried to ignore? I know you're saved and on your way to heaven, but there's that area that you don't talk about much. There's that area that you just chalk it up to, well, you know, that was just then and this is now. What's that skeleton that haunts you when you're all alone? That failure that haunts you that hurt, that haunts you. The good news is you love Jesus and you're on your way to heaven, but are you living the abundant life that Jesus declared that we could have if the skeletons are still haunting you? They haunt you. They haunt you and tell you, don't try that again. They haunt you and say, don't you ever trust another man. They haunt you and tell you, don't you ever trust another church. They haunt you and tell you, don't you ever dream another dream. They haunt you and tell you, don't you ever try to open another business. Don't you ever try to pray big prayers of faith. Don't you? They haunt you and tell you what you can and cannot do. But I'm here to declare to you that the valley is not my home. Amen. Now that you're strong, is anybody in here redeemed? Strong? God has brought you out. I bet you there's some of you here and some of you listening, if we would have seen you five years ago, we wouldn't even recognize you. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and God is strengthening you. And now God's hand is on you. And He's taken you so high, so now you are able to go so low. Um, look, I, I, I dare you to look at the skeletons in your closet and ask the question God asked Ezekiel. Can these bones 
live again? I know you had a failed marriage, but can this new one, can it live? Or is it going to follow the same pattern? Can these bones live again? Are you hearing me today? Um, uh, I, I think for me, what I, I hope that we would hear is, I know the bones can't talk, but for just a moment, could you hear the bones in your closet, the skeletons in your closet, begging you, please don't leave me here. Please don't leave, please don't leave me in Atlanta. I, I have a higher calling. When I was 19, I... When I was 20, I, in my first marriage, I, in my, I grew up in a home that, yeah, yeah, I know, and, and we want to move on to the future, but is it possible that our God that stands on the outside of time, He's before the beginning and He's after the end, everybody, and so He can go back and heal the past. The bones are crying out, please don't leave me here. Your broken childhood is begging you, please don't leave me here. Your wounded, abandoned childhood, your abuse is saying, please don't leave me here. Now that you've been saved, now that you've been redeemed, would you prophesy to the past hurts so that what used to be a failure can now be of victory. Can I leverage it for the glory of God? Come on, everybody. God is faithful to raise you up and lead you, not just through the good seasons, but the past seasons and the valleys of the past, the valleys of failure, the valleys of abuse, the valleys of defeat and resurrection and death and heal a hurt. He only brings you back to the death of a valley after you've been strengthened. He doesn't bring you back to your failures to torture you or to condemn you, but He builds you up so now you're strong enough to handle in your strength what you couldn't handle in your weakness. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ. Whoo, man, I wish I had a crowd of people here. You're acting like you're 500 in here tonight. Okay, let me deal with this real quick. There's some things in the valley that we don't like. And so most of us, once we come out of that season of our life, we've all gone through a valley. Most of us, when we come out of that valley, we leave that valley and we're just moving on, right? And I'm not trying to conjure up some bad things here. Because there's some things in the valley we don't want to deal with. Let's look at some of the things. I'm going to try to give you four. Let's talk about some of the reasons we don't go back to the valley and what's in the valley. Number one, the first thing that we see in the valleys uh, is that we see tears in the valley. I think that's what we see first. And the tears, uh, how many have been in a valley and shed some tears? Give me a hand on the emojis, all right? Uh, I mean, in the valley, the valley is usually full of tears. And I've been with some of you long enough now, I, I, I've been there and I know the tears. And I know the valleys. And the, the, the tears, they represent heartbreak, and they represent loss, and they represent hurt, and they represent disappointment, and they represent abandonment, and they represent, it's the valley of tears. Matter of fact, in Psalms 84, verse number 6, it says it this way, as they pass through the valley of Baca, it's in your notes. I'm going to give you the definition. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Is that all I got on that? And 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 it's the valley of Baca. It's a valley of tears. It's a valley that nobody wants to go through. If you study this geographically, the study the, the valley of Baca, it was filled with thorns. It was filled with wild animals. It was filled with pitfalls. It was filled with snakes. Nobody wants to go through a valley of snakes. The word Baca, the, the word Baca means tears. The valley of tears. If you've lived long enough, you've been through it. Have you ever been there? Sure we have. But here's what's cool when you study it geographically, and not just geographically, but metaphorically, it's the same. You had to go through the valley of Baca, the valley of tears, because the valley of Baca got them to Jerusalem. That doesn't mean nothing to me. Okay, let me help you apply it. 
it's the valley. Often it's the, well, first of all, it led them to Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem is where the temple of God was. And in the Old Testament, the temple of God represented the presence of God. Oftentimes, we have to go through some valley of tears to get to the presence of God. How many of you would say amen to the fact that I would go through the same tears again if those tears are what lead me to God. I wonder if this valley we're in right now, I know you already know God, but what if this valley is intended and these tears are intended to lead you to the deeper things of God? What if God wants to do something new, but you got to go through the valley of Baca to get there? Amen. Number two, the second thing that's in the valley, there's giants in the valley. Come on, anybody that's ever been in children's church or Sunday school knows there are giants in the valley. That's where Goliath was. He was in the valley, right? Uh, some say that COVID-19 is a threatening giant. This whole thing has been a mess, threatening us, mocking us. How will we ever defeat it? When will it finally end? Where's the vaccine? Where's the medicine? Where's the hand of God? When will things get... When will the giant stop standing on the opposite bank and mocking us? And we hear the story in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Check this out. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah. The valley of Elah. And they drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites the other with the valley in between them. And of course, you know the rest of the story. The battle between David and the battle between Goliath, it happened down in the valley of Elah. And, and, and all were looking at the giant. All were intimidated by the giant. All were looking at the giant. But one man, all were looking at the giant. <clears throat> and all were looking at the valley. But one man wasn't looking at the giant. He was looking at God. Come on now. Can, can, you, can you keep your eyes on God even though you're in a valley right now? All, every one of them, all the trained soldiers, so he's so big, we'll never knock him down. David said, he's so big, I can't help but hit him. How I many know we need a little bit of faith like that, right everybody? And by the way, here's what's interesting. There was never a giant script, there was never a giant killer in all of scripture until the valley of Elah and little David went down there with his five stones and he killed Goliath and from that point on we see giant killers rising up and killing other giants. Maybe God has allowed you to go through the valley of Elah because you're going to be the first one to do something that nobody else in your genealogy has ever done. Maybe you're going to break a generational curse but you got to quit cursing the valley and get in the valley and look at God. Come on and say a good amen to that. He's built you up. He's built you to take you into a valley to speak to those bones and break generational curses. Why? Because the valley is not my home. The third thing that we see in the valley is we see this. Remember David said it. We see the shadows of death. Woo! Right now, there's a whole lot of people seeing the shadows of death. This is the end. This is it. They're going to start tattooing our foreheads next. Everybody's talking about the shadows of death. That's what they're talking about. I think Christians ought to stop talking about the shadows of death and start talking about our morning light, Jesus. I know that's cliche, but it's still true. It's a shadow, everybody. How many remember being a kid? Maybe you weren't afraid of things like me. But in the shadow, did you know what shadows do? They distort things. Huh? I mean, I can get in the right place and stand and look at my shadow, and my legs are ten feet tall. Uh, my head's like way up there, bent against the corner of the wall. Because shadows distort things. You can, a little kid laying in bed at night, see a blanket on a chair, and that blanket on a chair, the shadow makes it look like the booger man. How many know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, shadows distort things. In other words, it's not real. And we remember David talking about these shadows in Psalms 23 when David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not really death. It's posing as death. 
I'll let you read between the lines. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they are the ones that comfort me. This reminds me that what I see in the valley, what I hear on the news, what I see happening is distorted. If it doesn't line up with God's Word, things are bad. I'll admit that. Things are bad. But things aren't that bad. How could you say that? Because God's good is always better than the worst bad there is. <laughs> One thing I've learned about being in the valley is you've got to just keep on walking. He, he's in the middle of the valley for a reason. Because he's far enough in, but he's still got some to go. You, listen, everybody, you, whether you feel like it or not, there's days I'm so sick of this mess that I just I don't even want to write another message. I just don't. But no, no, you got to get up and keep putting one foot in front of the other. One day at a time. One day at a time. Come on, everybody. Right? you, you got to keep on walking through the valley. Mm, because the valley is not my home. Right, everybody? When you stop walking, you accept where you are as your destination. When you stop walking, when you stop in the middle of your discouragement, when you stop in the middle of fill in the blank, you're saying, this is my destination. But I promise you, it's not God's destination for you. Keep on walking. you got to walk when you don't feel like walking. Remember last week? you got to drink some water when you don't feel thirsty. Come on now. You gotta, you gotta get up and pray. You gotta get up and get in the presence of God. You gotta get up and ignore some bad and put on some good, everybody. Um, are you guys doing all right? I know it's hot in the building. Let me do one more, all right? Can we do one more? Um, oh, by the way, before I get off that one, the shadow, the the, the shadow of death. You know what changes the shadow? Come on, everybody, preach it to me. Light. Maybe that's why the Bible says it might be dark right now, but joy comes in the morning. Because the light, if you're down, if you're in the shadow of death, if you're in the valley, you got to get some light on the situation. you got to get some light on the situation. Let me do the last one. The last one is very obvious. We've been spending three weeks now talking about it. The last one is there's bones in the valley. And we already know what the bones represent. The, the, the bones represent dead things. But don't let Ezekiel 37 get stuck as a great Old Testament fable. Because they're skeletons in the closet. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ezekiel 37, let me move you to verse number 2, and I'll close this thing up. He led me back and forth. Man, this thought captured me. There wasn't a pile of bones right here. No, no, he led me back and forth. In other words, there's some distance between the end and the beginning. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of hurt. And he, and he wanted me to see all of the death because I, the, the measure of how dead it was is equated to the miracle of how great it's going to be. Don't let this present suffering be compared to the future glory that God has for us. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor. On the floor. On the floor. Uh, I have any fight fans in here? It's okay. You can admit it in church. All right. Uh, me and AJ. Lisa, come on, girl. All right now. No wonder AJ's so well behaved when you're around. All right. Me and my son and AJ and Lisa. Woo! -hoo! When you're on the floor, when you're on the mat, it means you're done. Right? I, 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 there, the bones on the floor of the valley. Bones. He keeps saying it. That were very dry. Hmm. Now, Ezekiel doesn't tell us what caused this army to die. I mean, we know now, but at the time, it doesn't say, well, this army beat this army. We don't know that. Neither do we know what caused the skeletons in your closet. What army caused 
you to stop living? What fear, what past, what mistake, what is keeping you in the valley? And can I declare it one more time? The valley is not your home. Failure is never final. God wants to lift you way up so we can go back and fix the things of the past. What stopped you? Did discouragement stop you? Did bitterness, did hurt, did disappointment, did loneliness, did pride? And here you are visiting the same bones, being asked the same question. Can these bones live? Can generational curses be broken? Can hurts be healed? Can doubt turn to trust? Can depression turn to joy? Can fear turn to peace? And one more time I want to say, I hear a bone collector picking up the dead things. So the answer is unequivocally yes. These dead bones shall live again. Can I get an amen in the house? The valley's not your home, and if you've been listening to this message, I want to pray with you right now online. I may never meet you, but God knows exactly where you're at right now. In this room, I have a handful of Christians that are praying for you right now. We may never meet you, but God has assembled us because this might be your day. Where you're at is not where you have to stay. I don't know what your past looks like. I don't know what hurts you've had to overcome and mistrust, but God is there, and He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And maybe church has abused you, and church has made this way more than it's supposed to be. A relationship with God is very simple. Jesus made it that way. The Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe with our heart, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So I want to pray with you that are watching online. And uh, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you can keep your eyes open and heads up. But if you want to bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray this prayer. And those that are in the room are going to repeat it with me just like you might do at home. Father God, thank you for Jesus. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior and my best friend. From this day forward, I'm going to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you said that prayer, we really believe that you're, you know, God will meet you right where you're at. Let us know about it. We'd love to help you out on the journey. Uh, there's a little, some icons there that are popping up on your page right now. If you're watching at RadiusChurch.tv, if not, you can just email us or even say something right there on the live stream before we sign out. And one of our team or myself will get back with you and help you along on the journey. God bless you until we meet again.